So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this data seminar. Um, we'll uh, today we'll hear about uh, a chef from uh, Dan van der Ster and uh, Pablo Lopez from Milan, um, and we'll hear about uh, we'll hear about their experience with uh, the chef storage uh, system uh, that they have deployed at, at CERN, and where they are managing more than fifty petabytes of data across all of their clusters. Um, we expect this uh, this audience to be familiar with with technical terms with the uh, storage te technical terms. So, uh, but I ask Dan and Pablo to uh, to give a brief overview of, of uh, Seth anyway. So, and then go into more details like later. So now I'll, I'll shut up and <laughs> let the, the the experts talk, <laughs> please. Thanks. Thanks, Alberto. Thanks for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we're um, we're from the CERN IT department. We are, uh, Pablo and I are in different groups. I'm in the storage group and Pablo's in the computing group. And we work together on different types of Ceph storage. So it's a pleasure to be here to speak. Just get started. So quickly for those that maybe have are not familiar with where with with CERN. This is CERN. It's in uh, it's located in Geneva, Switzerland, like kind of halfway across the border between France and Switzerland. It's twenty seven kilometer circumference underground ring, hundred meters under the ground, colliding particles in opposite directions to discover the fundamental fundamental nature of matter. Around the around the 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 corners, there are these detectors like CMS, LHCb, Atlas, Alice. These are large cameras, basically detectors taking pictures of, uh, of collisions. This is what the tunnel looks like underground. Superconducting magnets accelerate and bend the, the proton beams to collide. This is what the detectors look like. So there's a, there's a scientist there. There's a physicist standing, but so you, can, so you can understand the scale of it. Um, and this is what it's all for. It's for taking pictures of collisions. This is a picture of a Higgs boson candidate. So this is one of the candidates that's uh, that's responsible for uh, for for mass. Okay, so this was a this was a Nobel Prize winning picture, basically. Now on to Ceph. So this outline of this talk. So I'll cover the first two parts, which is what is Ceph and how does it work. Actually, we'll go into a bit of detail there because it's quite, quite interesting, I think, to people. We'll explain the Ceph use cases at CERN, and then we'll explain about uh, CephFS for HPC. Uh, so what is Ceph? And now I'll just say that these slides are credit mostly to Sage Wilde, the inventor of Ceph. He's got a nice deck that, that we borrowed liberally from. So the buzzwords of what is Ceph, so you might hear like software defined storage, unified storage system, scalable, uh, future of storage, Linux of storage. Okay, but what's the substance behind this is that it, Ceph's an open source software. Uh, it runs on commodity hardware. So we, we buy com commodity servers, IP networks, uh, enterprise HDDs, SSDs, NVMEs, NVDIMs. And then with that, we make a, a single cluster that can serve object, block, and file workloads. Um, Ceph's reliable storage. It lets you build a reliable service out of unreliable components. So there's no single points of failure. Uh, it gives you durable data storage by replication or erasure coding. And things like upgrading or expanding or contracting the size or replacing hardware involves no interruption of service, fully online, 100% uptime. Um, Ceph favors consistency and correctness over performance. So that's important. Um, when you see when you see how Ceph performs later, um, Ceph's also scalable, so it's elastic storage infrastructure. You can grow or shrink. You can add the add hardware while it's um, while it's running and under load. Uh, you can scale up with bigger and faster hardware or out with capacity. Um, and you can also federate multiple clusters across sites with different technologies, which are higher level, which I'll get into a bit. Um, in the end, in one picture, this is the unified storage system, which is Ceph. It has a object storage, object storage layer named Rados at the bottom, which is accessed by a, a library called LibRados. And then on top, there's three main use cases object storage compatible with S3 and Swift via something called the Rados Gateway, block storage via a library and interfaces known as RBD, and a distributed network file system known as CephFS. 
So Ceph is also a, a big community. Ceph is a, has a foundation, part of the Linux Foundation with all of these members. Uh, in the bottom right, you can see many like labs and universities. Uh, and then there's like tons of com companies, a few tens of companies involved supporting Ceph and supporting Ceph developers and helping to organize conferences and meetups and all of those things that go into open source uh, communities these days. Um, I'll explain now the technologies inside Ceph. So first, Rados. Rados is the reliable autonomic distributed object store. So it gives that common object storage layer underneath all of the Ceph-based services. It's, uh, it gives low level object storage. It, it's reliable and highly available. Um, it's scalable and it manages all replication and erasure coding, data placement, rebalancing, repairs, all of this. It's strongly consistent, so CP. And it, uh, it's having this reliable layer lets you simplify uh, all the higher level layers. Um, the components of, of Ceph are something called the monitor, which is a central authority. It's, it serves small cluster maps to coordinate the, 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 all of the demons involved. Um, something called the manager, which is for offloading non-critical, non-like service critical, but still useful things like metrics or pluggable components. Um, and then OSDs, the object storage daemon. These are the these are the daemons that do the majority of the work, the heavy lifting of storing files, storing objects, replicating, and cooperatively like peering and doing all of the the data movement and data access. And there's like tens to thousands of these per cluster. So how does Ceph look? So first I'll show, I'll remind like how does legacy client server architecture work? You have an application at the top that talks to a, a server that then like uses backends to, to uh, serve your requests. If the, if the server is down, okay, you have things like you can have like IPs failing over and then you have a backup server that then at a, at a network level is recovering and, 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 and uh, keeping the, the application highly available. This is not how Ceph works. Ceph has application interfacing to the storage through something called Librados. And then Librados is handling all of the intelligence needed to access an entire cluster with hundreds or thousands of, of, of demons and moving parts, things going up and down. Um, the, li the, the library is still simple, but what's underneath is much more complex. Um, how is data placed? In a, in, a, in a Rados cluster. So you have an application that wants to store an object. How do you, how do you know where in the cluster to, to send it? Um, in a, let's say traditional or old school uh, clustered storage system, it would ask some central authority um, where it should store it and that central authority. So it could look up, okay, but that's slow. And then it would also be hard to scale to, scale to trillions of objects. So a better way to do this is to use calculated placements where you have, in Ceph's case, you have the mon um, use, having some kind of state of the cluster, sharing that with the client, and the client using that state to compute where it should send the data, okay? So for example, it can get a state, a cluster map, which has the layout, including the number of OSDs. Um, and then, for example, if the topology changes in real time, uh, like uh, a disk failing or a host failing, uh, the the application gets a new map and then recalculates a new place to send the object. And similarly, all of the OSDs and all of the components in the cluster get the same map at the same time. They all know that the data needs to move to a different place in case of a failure. That's the general idea. So how is this done into more detail? So you have some disks or some files or some films or some pictures, you want to store them. Okay, so these get, let's say one film file gets cut into several objects. Um, those objects, you want to logically store them in a pool. A pool is a thing that can store billions or trillions of objects, okay, petabytes of data in one pool, but that's a logical construct. What we do in Ceph is we carve a single pool into several things called placement groups. So placement groups are um, basically you take all of the objects, you take an object in a pool, and you do a hash of the object name divided by, well, modulo the number of placement groups in that pool. And that gives you the placement group ID where you would store it, okay? And then there's some magic that happens and which maps a placement group to an OSD, which is a disk. Um, and you see like, for example, this placement group what 1.0 is stored on the first disk, the third disk and the fourth disk, okay? 
Now, how do you actually place those placement groups? That's with this magic component in Ceph called Crush. Okay, it's a pseudo random placement algorithm. Um, it's a it's similar to consistent hashing, but not not exactly. The inputs are the topology of the cluster, so like the ORSD hierarchy, um, things like OSDs are in a host, they're in a rack, they're in a room. Okay, and then the, the administrator can say they can define rules, such as I want three replicas in different racks only on SSDs, or I want six plus two erasure coding, two per rack only on HDDs. Okay, and this crush algorithm is outputting a list of or an ordered list of OSDs for that placement group. Um, it's stable. If the topology changes, like if you add hosts or if you remove disks fail, there's a there's a minimal amount of data movement after after such a such a topology change. And it also supports varying device sizes. So you can have some six terabyte drives, some 12 terabyte drives, some one terabyte uh, NVMEs. You can have a mix in the cluster and it proportionally distributes the objects. Um, each Rados pool must be durable and each PG must be durable to make the pools durable. So Ceph does this with two ways replication, so identical copies of each PG. Here, this is the, the picture on the left. If you have two objects, data and my object, you have uh, three copies of each, okay? You just store them exactly. Um, this is a 200% overhead, but it's fast. Uh, but you can also do erasure coding. So this is like RAID over the network. Um, each object is split into chunks and then you compute parity or uh, other, other K type shards or M for parity or redundancy. Um, usually we have something like 50% overhead. So like four data stripes, two parity stripes, or some people do eight and three. Um, it's, 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 uh, you can use arbitrary K and M in Ceph. Of course, they have implications on performance and availability. But in general, like to conclude on Rados, it's like something that lets an operator define what they want, like, 3x replicated SSD pools or erasure coding with 8 plus 3 on HDDs or 3x replicated HDD pools. And then magic happens and everything is stored down on the devices. Um, and that's implementing like giving you a platform for high level services. Now I go into those services. First, Rados Gateway, object storage. Um, it's giving you object storage compatible with S3 from Amazon and Swift, which is from OpenStack. Uh, this is a concept that has users. Users create buckets and users store objects in those buckets. And then there's data and permissions. They have access keys to, to, to access these. And there's lots of different APIs that can be used to delegate access. Um, and, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that like Rados objects are not the same as the RGW objects. Like an S3 object can be very big. It can be one terabyte and that gets split into many smaller smaller Rados objects. How it looks like inside is that, for example, you want to do a put, you put to this gateway, which itself speaks libredos. So it, it, it has some pools that know about users and buckets. Okay, that's step one. It then knows, okay, it, it has a different pool for bucket indices. These are like lists of the objects in a bucket. Okay, and then it has data pool to actually store the objects or to read the objects um, and then also update the index. You can have multiple uh, zones in a cluster or they can be in separate clusters um, and you can configure stuff to share the user and bucket info between the two zones. And similarly, so these, this could be, for example, you can have zones with replication or expensive fast and you can have cheap erasure coded um, with, different, uh, with different performance qualities. Um, similarly, you can have zone groups, which is a higher level concept that ensures replication between zone groups. So for example, you want to create a bucket, you want to make sure it's always replicated between two data centers. Um, you can have this all part of one realm. So it's, it's, like, it's like a very, it's very flexible federation and geo-replication service all built in. There's lots of other features. I won't go into all of them in detail, but I'll say that um, like our users use the lifecycle management a lot. So that's like, they can define policies for cleaning up objects, like expiring them after a certain amount of time. Um, and then also like interesting is there's a pub sub event system. So you can set up 
kind of serverless processes based on uh, sending objects to buckets, getting and getting uh, getting actions triggered afterwards. Now go to block storage. So RBD is about creating virtual block devices, so virtual disks uh, stored in Rados. Um, it's like it's made for things like uh, KVM, QMU, running in OpenStack, for example, or Linux hosts that you want to attach a virtual disk to. Um, in both cases, you like need to format that with a file system. Normally, um, it's analogous to EBS in AWS. Um, yeah, it's well integrated with things like OpenStack and Kubernetes and, and other cloud platforms. Uh, basically, the idea is it's taking one large disk image, maybe 10 terabytes, carving it into tiny pieces again and sending that into your Rados cluster. It supports some really useful high-level features like these, those disk images can be snapshotted. Um, you can create read-only snapshots, point in time consistent. Uh, you can then clone from those snapshots. So for example, the base OS can be snapshotted and then cloned. And then those are like thinly provisioned, only the changes. So you can have thousands of VMs booting from a clone of, a, of an OS image, and then only the dish changes are stored. Um, it's very fast. Um, and then also you can mirror block devices between different pools so when you're writing to when you're writing data to like cluster a you can actually enable like a kind of journaling which is kind of like a redo log which is which is stored in rados as well and then as a new daemon called the rbd mirror daemon which is highly available also replays the rights to your images on cluster a in a different cluster cluster b so that can be for for uh, disaster recovery purposes um, lots of other features there as well. Um, I can say that RBD top is very useful. We use that. So you can have a real time view of the IO activity and see who are your most active users in case of any kind of problems. Um, lots of other, lots of other goodies there. Now come to CephFS. Um, CephFS is a distributed network file system. So this is like NFS. It's what you expect. Um, important thing about CephFS is that it's really like strongly consistent and coherent across many nodes. So the design goal is to be like the consistency of a local disk for all the users across the network. Um, updates on one node are visible immediately to everyone else. Um, the Ceph lets you scale the metadata and data independently. So there's a separate data and metadata pool. And there are clients, it's showing here case FFS, there's clients built into the Linux kernel and there's also Fuse clients. Yeah. Um, to implement CephFS, there's a new daemon needed, the MDS, the metadata server. It manages in memory the file namespace and it caches like inodes and directory nodes um, to make everything fast and coordinates between clients to handle cache consistency and locks and giving leases out so that clients can do buffered IO and all of the things that are needed to make uh, POSIX file system fast. Um, each cluster has one to 10 of these, oops, I should go back. Let's say 10 plus standbys, and then they can fail over. So we have this happening sometimes, network outage, you have the MDS have to fail over to another one. And this is maybe a few tens of seconds, depending on the size of the cluster and the activity. And you have, and you have a, um, the cluster back online again. Uh, here's a picture uh, of the metadata, basically like a kernel client will be looking in the metadata server um, the directories are all stored in a metadata pool. Um, this is also journaled for this for this kind of like uh, easy recovery from from crashes. And then data objects are actually stored in a data pool, which can be replicated or erasure coded, depending on your requirements. Um, there's a scalable name safe space. So how Ceph does this is uh, you can just Basically, each if you have several MDSs, so here in this picture we have five MDSs. Each MDS is responsible for a different part of the tree in the namespace, the directory trees. So this is the root, and then this is like slash home or whatever. Um, the by default, Ceph is actually looking at the the temperature of different subdirectories and like rebalancing in real time the the subdirectories out to these different MDSs, and then there's different heuristics for tuning this. And it's also possible to, uh, if you know your workload ahead of time, to pin to specific uh, MDSs. So like in us at CERN, we use on our largest FFS, we have four active MDSs and we pin exactly the, where we want things to be, to be, um, to be balanced. 
Now, CEPFS supports snapshots. Um, any directory can have a snapshot. Um, you just CD to a hidden directory called .snap and you, and you mkdir there, and then now you have a snapshot of the parent. You can also remove that directory with rmdir. Uh, it's efficient, fast, but then it's, um, it's uh, the delete, you, you have to pay the cost of the deletion time, basically. It, it, can, it does a snap trimming thing to the users. It looks very fast, but then as a Ceph operator, this can be like a kind of IO intensive deletion that happens behind the scenes. Um, there's also some neat features like recursive accounting. So from any directory, you can see the recursive stats, like the number of bytes stored or the latest change time or the number of entries or files or subdirectories all beneath all the way. So you can use this to very quickly like discover if like if subtrees have changed, like without iterating through all the files and going through the whole directories, you can see, oh, this, this like somewhere deep in this directory, something has changed. So that can be useful for, for like backups or things like that. There's lots of other features, of course, which I won't go into uh, uh, in detail. Um, you'll probably hear about uh, lazy IO in a, in a few slides from Pablo. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, the kernel client is extremely high performance. Like compared to Fuse, the kernel client works, works very well. And most of our, we have something like maybe 2000 users, like most are using kernel client by now. Um, so that's basically it, the complete storage platform, Rados, object storage, block storage, and file. So now I'll go into Ceph use cases at CERN. So the CERN computing infrastructure is not, we're not a supercomputer center. We're more of a high throughput scientific computing center. Uh, we have batch system with something like 250 CPU cores with HD Condor. We have a storage system called EOS written at CERN managing around 500 petabytes of raw storage. And then the CERN tape archive is, a, is similarly written at CERN uh, for long-term archival, over half an exabyte of tape managed by CTA. But we also have like the traditional IT infrastructure needs, like uh, we have lots of VMs and databases that need NASs and block storage. Um, we have lots of web and cloud native applications. Uh, we have small MPI clusters. Um, we have generally an open infrastructure of things, um, which are like, I put all those like logo, logo soup here on the slide showing all the kinds of technologies that we use. And they're all basically, they can be, if you need to run this kind of stuff, you can run it on Ceph. That's why we, that's kind of why we have Ceph. So currently in production, I'll just go through briefly what we have. For block storage, uh, we have three large clusters. Uh, basically on spinning disks, around 24 petabytes raw at the moment. Um, we also have three all flash clusters around a petabyte raw. And there we do two plus two erasure coding, which is interesting, but it's like kind of a, a balance between performance and uh, space needed. These are all integrated into OpenStack under multiple QoS types. So a QoS type is basically just an IOPS throttle and also availability zones. So we, by default, we just kind of spread the, the, the volumes requests across different clusters, but also users can say they want it here, or they want it here for, for different availability reasons. We also have two S3 clusters in two different data centers, uh, around 12 petabytes raw now. They're all, they're both uh, four plus two erasure coding on spinning disks with bucket indices on SSDs. And these are currently independent realms, but like right now at this moment, we're working to make this zone group replication working. We're configuring that. Uh, on the CephFS side, we have two general purpose large HDD clusters, always with RocksDB on SSDs. Okay, so that's kind of a metadata component that goes with the OSDs. Over six petabytes raw at the moment. And we have one general purpose all flash CephFS cluster with half a petabyte. Um, but then we have several other, maybe three or four other smaller CephFS clusters on all flash targeted for specific use cases like some hyper-converged test for our databases group, um, for our enterprise group where they wanted a dedicated CephFS and also for HPC. Um, in general, our experience that Ceph is like, it lives up to the hype kind of, it's robust and performant. We've used it since 2013. Uh, data, aside from like a few strange incidents and amazing bugs, um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite good. Um, uh, basically, we've had like 100% uptime aside from those instances, never any data loss. Um, after in 
infrastructure outages, the failure recovery is basically transparent. It just comes back online basically by itself. Okay, sometimes it can be com complicated, but it's, it's usually quite okay. Um, and then also hardware replacement is like super easy. This is the killer feature of Ceph. We've gone through three procurement cycles. So we keep the st storage and clusters like living forever. They're like living organisms that live forever. We just replace the hardware. We never transfer bytes around. Ceph does it all. We never ask users to transfer bytes around. Ceph does it for them. Um, so this is all mostly exposed via our OpenStack cloud. Uh, also since 2013, it's hosting 90% of the computing resources. Um, you can see there that it's like we have over 290,000 cores. Um, in here, in this picture, it shows, uh, here we go, like images. So these are like system disks stored on Ceph. Um, volumes, these are, these are RBD images on Ceph, uh, 6,000, so close to 7,000 uh, volumes. And then file shares, these are CephFSs. So these are users that create their own CephFS volume. We have over 2,000 of those. Um, I wanted to highlight one project, interesting project before handing it off to Pablo, one more, which is that like EOS is our large scale physics data storage, but um, being working in the same group, we're always interested to like see if there's kind of synergies between Ceph team and EOS team. So EOS was developed at CERN for physics and regular users and managing like 350 petabytes right at the moment, close to 500 petabytes if you account for all the newest deliveries. Um, so we asked ourselves, like, is it feasible and even useful to layer EOS on top of a Ceph or CephFS backend? This would give us like the best of both worlds, feature re like EOS, which has all the features that the scientists need, that the high energy physicists need, plus the flexible object storage underneath provided by Ceph. So it turns out that this can be done, and we had a we did we did a paper about it, um, which you can click the link later uh, to to read about that. But basically, because EOS is built upon something called XRD, and it's just so it's replicating and doing erasure coding itself and storing rep metadata <clears throat> in something called QuarkDB, uh, but actually underneath it stores the files in XFS in local XFS. So it uses a simple like inode hash naming convention. And why don't we just instead of using XFS, use CephFS? So we did this as a test and a proof of concept with with sixteen machines and hundred gig Ethernet. And we actually had it was quite it was quite a, quite a successful test. Um, you can read about it more in the paper if you're interested or get in touch. Um, and that's the end of my part. So I'll hand it off to you, Pablo. I'll continue sharing the screen and click when you when I sense that it's the next slide. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Right. So uh, now I'm gonna talk about our our experience in using CephFS uh, for HPC clusters. So, so first thing is why would we use FFS for HPC? Because this is a very unconventional file system to use in an HPC environment. Uh, well, there, there's several reasons, but um, one of the main reasons is that at some we're already running this whole zoo of, of file systems, right? We have EOS, we have uh, CBMFS, we have AFS, and we have CephFS. And uh, we actually wanted to give it a try and see if it would work. Um, because we didn't have a desire to introduce yet another file system. Uh, we didn't have any experience with Luster or GPF, GPFS. Um, so we decided to give CFFS a try. So also part of the reason is that um, the way we procure HPC clusters at CERN uh, is not the, the usual way of procuring it from some, some vendor and getting like the whole HPC cluster delivered, installed and, and running. What we do is that we place uh, what the CERN procurement team does is that we we place a very large order of servers, and these these servers uh, will be destined for different purposes. For instance, uh, for the HTC, as in high throughput computing cluster, or for storage. And then uh, this will be a very large order, and a subset of those machines will then be intended to become an HPC cluster. And then we just add. Uh, open source software, and we buy a uh, low latency intercon interconnect such as InfiniBand uh, to interconnect those clusters. And voila, we have the um, an HPC cluster. This is not a; these are not huge HPC clusters, but still. Um, so uh, we validated CephFS as a multi-purpose file system, including use as a scratch space file system for for HPC workloads. And it actually has been working. Uh, Quite well, uh, we have accumulated over five years of experience running CephFS on uh, CERN IT's HPC service in production. 
uh, we use Slurm uh, and uh, together we'll set. Yeah, that's fine. You can you can skip. Thanks. <laughs> um, so this is a, a logical overview of how we did it at the beginning. So I'm going to walk you through the um, evolution of how we started and then what things I'm going to focus a bit more on what things did not work that well and what things we changed and how we evolved uh, the, the infrastructure. So in the beginning, we had, as you can see on the left, uh, the HPC cluster, um, which everything, everything, all, almost everything in, the, in our infrastructure is uh, provisioned uh, in an OpenStack environment. So even the HPC worker nodes, they're bare metal, but they're provisioned by, by OpenStack. Um, and then on some other end of the data center, we have this, this, this CephFS storage cluster. And uh, through the OpenStack APIs, we would provide a scratch space that the worker nodes would mount and we would access. And this worked well, but uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the one of the issues is that this was uh, the this CFFS cluster that the worker nodes, which are the Ceph clients, uh, were mounting uh, to access the scratch space. This was in a shared CFFS cluster. When I say shared, I mean this was shared with other IT services. It was not dedicated for for HPC. Uh, as a result, in occasions, sometimes we, we experience contention. Uh, you know, if, if, if uh, somebody was running a huge uh, backup or we replacing a lot of files and it was they were running a very IO intensive workload, uh, we would basically affect each other. Uh, another issue, probably the, the biggest issue was the fact that the cluster was not very close in the network. So it was far in the data center. Um, and therefore, any network issue, it would be far more likely that we would, ex we would experience issues uh, when there was some kind of network issue. There was, of course, much greater IO latency as a result of this. Um, so this was this worked, but we had we faced the, those issues. Um, another thing is that we relied on Ceph Fuse mounts. So this is uh, Fuse's uh, file system in user space. Um, as a result, uh, well, Fuse is known for being not super performant. And the Cephuse implementation, in addition, uh, well, I'm not sure if this was the Cephuse implementation of Fuse itself, but from time to time, especially with uh, when facing network issues, uh, we were we were facing stack mounts, stale data, and, and things like that uh, that we had to fight. Um, but then later on, we evolved into uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, we transitioned all of these. Two things. So first, we transitioned to a dedicated CFS cluster, and and this and this proved, uh, of course, as expected, uh, this provided much greater performance and resiliency, um, and also that the Cephuse mounts, as long as soon as the the kernel code was ready, we transitioned to kernel mounts, uh, and then we experienced much greater performance, uh, also much greater stability and improved resiliency for network fail failures. And actually, we haven't experienced any any issues uh, with stack mounts or stale data, anything like that, ever since we transitioned to kernel mounts. Uh, even if you lose the network, uh, they they will auto heal as soon as the network is available again. Um, we 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 experienced no data corruption, no data loss ever uh, for a few years now, which is which I think is great. Um, and finally, when I say we. We have a dedicated cluster. Actually, what we did was that we didn't procure a new storage cluster. What we did was that we used one of our uh, HPC partitions and we transformed it into a hyperconverged cluster, meaning that we run the Ceph OSD daemons on the actual compute nodes. So the, the compute nodes in the cluster are both the serving as a storage backend on the compute nodes. And this provided many benefits. Um, Next slide, please. It's probably many benefits, uh, especially when it comes to network locality. Um, I've listed here in this slide a, a, a few things that we tuned, uh, where we where we found that tuning these things uh, gave us greater performance. Um, the, the biggest one by far was the network locality, because it was a hyperconverged cluster. The latency, which was obviously reduced dramatically. And just this uh, provided a 10x uh, performance increase. Uh, we also tuned the replica account, uh, which obviously also has an impact on write latency. So this is something to take into account. If you're using it for a scratch space, maybe you don't, you do not need, you know, three replicas or more. 
uh, if you lower them, you will you will improve that. Uh, in our case, uh, even though it is a scratch space, um, all the Slurm services are also relying uh, a bunch of things that we've built on top. Also, are relying on the CephFS mount, so we we do have we do keep three replicas because Ceph is quite good at uh, keeping the uptime with with that replica count. Um, we were also exp uh, experimenting with the metadata server balancing with a meta MDS. Um, so if you have more than one MDS, uh, as Dan already explained, uh, all the, the hot directories uh, will be migrated across MDSs. So all, all of that will work, will work well. However, we found that if you know that, a work, that there's going to be a very intensive workload and it's going to happen in one subdirectory, you can pin that subdirectory to a single MDS. And usually a single MDS can handle millions of files without an issue. So uh, this is usually not a limitation for a single workload. And if you pin it to an MDS, um, then Ceph will not attempt you to migrate it to other MDSs and split it and do any other optimizations. And actually it will work, um, it will work a lot better in our experience. And then finally, uh, we've been experimenting with the single largest limitation we found from the start uh, um, for using CFFS with HPC workloads, uh, which, is, which is a mode called lazy IO. Um, so one of the biggest limitations is that since CFFS uh, wants to be a very POSIX, uh, it wants to be POSIX basically, so uh, if, if you have, you want to maintain this, this POSIX consistency model and the, all the coherency. So if you have a single shared file for doing collective IO, which is common in certain HPC workloads, um, maintaining this POSIX consistency means that um, Ceph was keeping locks, lock, locks on a file. Um, so lazy IO, if, can, you, can you move to the next slide, please? Lazy IO, when you activate lazy IO in Ceph, it refers to a mode in which this, these POSIX uh, semantics and consistency and, and coherency um, restrictions are dropped, they're relaxed, um, and then basically this allows for lock-free parallel writes. And this is great for if you're doing shared file collective IO. Um, the coherency, of course, is delegated to the application. So uh, if you write overlapping bits of the same file, then it's up to you. But uh, since HPC applications usually take this, take this into account, um, this provided great, a, a huge performance boost, of course, and allowed us to, um, to, to run uh, many HPC workloads. Uh, for instance, I'll, I'll, I remember that Alberto Chuzole, he was... Uh, he was running one of those uh, applications on our cluster and taking advantage of, of this lazy I.O. mode. Um, yeah, next slide, please. I see, um, if you don't mind, I see a question in the chat. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll do that at the, at the end. Uh, so now I want to go into the, some of the limitations that we found with, with this approach. Uh, especially referring to, to, to hyperconverged. This is not just CFFS. These are, these are limitations that we, that we found about this hyperconverged architecture. And then also uh, introduce some of the solutions that we're working on. So by far, maybe one of the things that worry, us, worry the most, uh, that are the most worrying for us, is the impact of uh, this noise of IO-intensive applications uh, on the on the workloads that are running on, on the compute node. And uh, we have in particular one application, uh, one HPC workload that is called OpenQCD. Uh, OpenQCD is used by the theorists at CERN. Um, and, and this HPC application is a very tightly coupled application. It has excellent scalability, uh, but it, it is very sensitive to this, this kind of OS noise. So um, we even had to disable uh, any kind of monitoring that we were running, even uh, lightweight monitoring tools, because we could see big performance drops when running OpenQCD on our worker nodes. Um, and in the case of hyperconverged, if there's a very IO intensive application, we measured the impact to be about 20% performance uh, drop, uh, which is obviously not, not negligible. Um, so uh, one of the solutions that we're that we're working on is to switch switch to hyperconverged burst buffers. 
So under uh, under this model, what would occur is that um, when a when a user runs a job uh, on a set of nodes, only those set of nodes would be in the same set of nodes that are running the workload would be involved in the I/O. So there would be no um, interference between users. Um, there's, there's many technical challenges uh, about doing this with FFS, but this is something that, that we're working on for the future. And then finally, to conclude, I wanna go into the uh, operational challenges of running uh, the, of, of this hyperconverged um, uh, solution. Uh, next slide, please. So of course, um, a very common uh, scenario is there's a security vulnerability in the kernel and you need to upgrade the kernel and then reboot the nodes. Um, so what we usually do is that we don't shut down the cluster, we do this transparently. So we, we drain machines and then we reboot them as they, as they get drained. Um, and the way this usually works in the batch system is you're, if you're running a normal batch system, they have the notion of draining a node. So you will drain a set of nodes and when the, job, uh, when the jobs finish, those nodes will be ready and you will be able to reboot them. However, in a, in a storage system, you can't just reboot uh, a machine uh, when it's ready uh, because it could, be, it could be hosting a replica. So if you, if, you, if, you reboot, if you shut down too many machines at once, uh, you could be reducing the, the data availability. So in the, in, the, in the group of clusters on the right-hand side, for instance, um, there's, a data, there's this red, red data uh, and there's the green data and there's two replicas of each. Um, so if you, you can shut down server three and server two, uh, because one replica of each would be available, but you wouldn't be able to, to, to shut down server three and server four, because then the, the, the green data would be unavailable, right? And in a hyper-converged architecture, you have both problems at once. You can't just, you can't just tell the batch system to drain the node and then just shut off and reboot those nodes because they're running, uh, the, the storage demons and the data may be unavailable. Um, so as a result, um, we developed this, uh, well, what we did is that we have this, this automation tool written at CERN, which we call brain slug. And this brain slug tool is a lightweight daemon that runs on every node. And basically it's like a, a machine state manager. Uh, so it knows how to handle slurm or an HD condor. Um, and it knows how to drain a machine on slurm or to, how to drain a machine on HD condor. Um, and then it manages the life cycle. Basically, this is what we've deployed on our on our on all of our cluster to manage all the over 250k cores. Um, and the cool thing about this uh, this tool is that it is able to manage the several concurrency strategies. Next slide. Next slide, please. So, as a result of being able to manage the concurrency, uh, a user defined concurrency strategy is that, is that you can you can do orchestration based on that. So for instance, you could say, um, I want to reboot, let's say, I want to I want to reboot the whole cluster, but I only want to have 10% of the cluster draining and rebooting at a time. Um, and, and these agents, they will they, they, they will coordinate this uh, by themselves. Um, the same thing happens if you have restrictions such as hyperconverged uh, file system, where you may have some data replication strategies where, for instance, uh, you may only reboot machines from the same row at the same time. So um, yeah, the, the, basically this, the, this tool will be able to, to orchestrate this. Uh, and and this, this plugs into our automation tools to, to handle all these cases. And, and that, that was it. Um, well, I think Dan will provide some final words and then we'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, I just wanted, so that's the end of our talk, but I wanted to just plug one thing, which is that there will be a Ceph Cephalocon conference. We're trying to somehow, hopefully this will be, we'll be able to have an in-person presence, but it will be a hybrid conference. So April 5th to 7th in Portland, we'll be getting together. And uh, so if you're interested in hearing more about Ceph or meeting other users or meeting developers involved in Ceph, uh, that's a great opportunity, I would say. And otherwise, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, we're happy to chat now. Also, feel free to get in touch with us via email. And uh, if you'd like to find out about Ceph, then Ceph.io is the website. So 
Uh, I see Shane, Shane Cannon, you, you asked the question about the alignment restrictions for on lazy IO. With alignment, do you mean like overlapping rights and things like that, or? I've just seen with some, like in Luster, you can turn off some of the, the locking pieces, but you have to block, you have to, you're then responsible for lining it at the block layer sometimes. I'm just wondering if, if the lazy mode has those types of restrictions or not. There's no, I mean, no, it's, you it's can just same. write at any offset. You can just write at any offset in the file and it's up to you. I as mean, long as they don't overlap or you manage that overlap, then it's, it's They fine. can overlap. Yeah. Last right wins. Yeah, just last right wins. Yeah. yeah. But you can't well, even get the file on the object level, but yeah. on the file level, yeah. What it what it's doing is normally like in Ceph FS, even if you use the, the thingy to lock a range, it doesn't just lock a range. It's locking to do the whole consistency. It's um it's locking an entire file. So the client gets a gets a capability, exclusive right capability. And then he's able yeah. with exclusive write cap capability, a client can write, can do buffered IO. And then as soon as another client wants to read, that the MDS revokes that exclusive capability. Now with lazy IO, um, so okay, if you have many writers, none of them get the exclusive write. So they end up like passing kind of like passing a token around who who writes. They write in a circle. So like it's really slow if they're all writing to the oh, same okay. file. With lazy IO, this is all relaxed and they can all just do buffered IO and they can all just write and flush, flush, flush. And, and, and the MDS just accepts everything and they just write directly to the data pools. And there's no, there's no more of this like uh, restriction about who can write and when. But if you're doing buffer a write and then there's a reader that wants to read, um, the writers, obviously they, they, they may read stale data unless the writers call lazy IO propagate, in which case everything would be consistent again. There's rock, lazy oh, basically left that up to the application. Yeah. One one quick follow up question. I don't think you ever said it. So, what's the kind of scale that you've operated at with the HPC model and CephFS? Scale in terms of uh, the the scale of the Hypermerge cluster. How many nodes or or how many? Yeah, nodes? number of nodes, number of you know OSDs. I guess maybe they're one to one or something. But yeah. So the HPC cluster is not very big. Uh, it's, it's maybe uh, the hyperconverged cluster is at like around 140 nodes. Um, okay. And every, every node has maybe three SSDs uh, serving. So it's, 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 over, it's over 300 pe uh, terabytes. Um, oh. So the, the cluster itself is not very big, but uh, I mean, the limitation here would not be CephFS because we, we have much bigger CFFS clusters. Um, I'm not sure if you're, I, I'm not sure where you're, uh, what your worry would be. We have, in terms of yeah, I mean, otherwise, I mean, outside of HPC, we have, we have multi-petabyte clusters and of order, like say two or 3000 clients, mostly like Kubernetes clients or other just generic, like Linux boxes doing stuff um, per attached to a single cluster. And there's a, there are, I've heard of others. I mean, there are there are others, of course, using it at, at bigger scale than us. I've heard of uh, late late latest. I've heard of someone with some that he submitted a patch set to make this even more efficient. But he was using he uses actively uh, ten thousand clients for some machine learning cases, uh, use cases. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, Seren had the first question in chat. People can also put their hand up if they want um, a virtual hand, <laughs> but we'll go through the chat once first. Okay, Seren. All right, uh, I was wondering uh, what kind of information can be added as metadata and if there are any restrictions on data type uh, for the metadata. I can take that one, I guess. Um... So each object, when you when you write an object, an object is normally something like a few tens of megabytes of data, okay, um, at mm -hmm. most. Um, now attached to that, you can they, there is a key value store attached to each object. So mm -hmm. you can you can um, in general, this is called the OMAP, the object map, and there you can have keys of say tens of characters and values of uh, 
uh, maybe a few kilobytes, um, something like this. So this OMAP, this object map is used internally by the Rados gateway to do the bucket indices, for example, and by the file system to do directories. So a directory node is actually just an empty object with inodes attached to it. That's how directory, that's how the file system structure is created. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so OMAP is the keyword there. And yeah, the restrictions are as I described. Is that, does that answer the question? Yeah, and the data type, does it have to be string data type or can it be any uh, float or uh, in the key value store? I think you can just pass any kind of, any kind of string buffer you want, any kind of buffer. I mean, you don't, you don't, there's an API for this. It's not, you don't use like a, you can use a CLI, but you use an API for this. So it's just binary data. Yeah, we, we, we were trying something with the Rados API and it was somewhat restrictive in um, that we had to convert data to strings first before putting it. But were you using, uh, you weren't using the CLI? No, no. we were using Rados API directly. If you if you want to follow up, so you can send a mail, and I can put you in touch with okay. someone right. who can help. Yep. Sure. Thanks. I have a, another question. Um, on. Well, we should wait for the, Francis. You should. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. Sorry. <laughs> I'll keep uh, order. <clears throat> Do you want to read out your question, Francis, or are you? Okay, all right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the talk. That was interesting. Um, well, I've seen a presentation about Ceph a few years ago where there was some experimentation uh, related to using uh, hardware that was really object oriented. So that your disk was actually providing a key value interface uh, as opposed to a block storage. Is that something that is still uh, alive and something that Ceph is using? Or are you uh, using a file system behind the scene to store the data that you store? Uh, yeah, so that was, I forget the name. That was a Seagate product, wasn't it? Um, I can't remember. Yeah, this was, so th this is not actively being worked on as far as I know. Um, so yeah, there was, so, okay, inside, inside the OSD, there's an abstract implementation of an object store under, inside the OSD. Um, in, the, in the early days of Ceph, this, they were trying to use BTRFS to do this, um, to take advantage of snapshots and everything like that, but it didn't perform well enough. So then they just implemented a simple one called file store, which used XFS. Uh, to store the all of the objects, um, but this eventually doesn't scale either because you have to put everything in directories, and then you have to like split the directories if they get too big, and then you have to merge the directories if they get too too small, and it just becomes like something that you can have like steps and gl glitches and latency increasing. So now, since the past like maybe four years ago, Seth implemented its own um, its own kind of file system behind the scenes. Um, so it's using, it's consuming disks, SSDs or NVMEs or HDDs. It just consumes them as raw devices now. And it, and it, um, I mentioned a few times in the slides, RocksDB. Okay. So it stores, it implements a very simple FS API so that RocksDB can run on top of the, the block devices. And it's using that so that the OST can keep track of which objects are stored locally and like store the cluster maps and things like that. Um, but then for the rest of the actual big blobs of data, it just has very simple allocators. Uh, actually, they're getting progressively more and more complex and pro progressively more and more um, performant uh, with every version of Ceph now. Um, but, but they're just consuming the, 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 the block devices raw now. Um, and yeah, that thing is actually quite good. It can do compression inside, like it can compress the objects before it stores them. Um, and that was what led to uh, something that Alberto said he he watched one of our talks from last year called the bug of the year, where Seth like found a bug in LZ4 compression library, which was very exciting. Managed to take down a whole cluster because it corrupted some like critical central maps. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Is that? Uh... Yes, thank you. That's that, yeah. that's useful. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we got Shane and then Alberto, um, and then we're approaching the top of the hour, so. Um, should probably let these guys go to sleep. <laughs> well, it's not that late, I guess. It's okay. Yeah. On, 
what I was curious about is I noticed, I think one thing that's really compelling about stuff is this idea that you could have like just blobs of storage and then you can compose it kind of dynamically in these different ways with these different um, interfaces, right? But I noticed in, in at least in your deployment, you it seems like you've partitioned a lot of these into separate file systems. And I'm just curious if like, I can see why there might be just kind of operational reasons that that has to be done, but do you think that that it's feasible to have a big, you know, pool of storage that you might use some for S3 and some for block and some for file systems, or do you think that pragmatically and sort of practically you, it's, it's kind of necessary to, to separate them out? Well, when we, when we started like several years ago, like we initially tried to throw everything in one cluster. Um, but it's difficult to control the like it's difficult to do QoS between the different pools in a Ceph cluster. So, like, we you notice that we I mentioned QoS types in the block storage. This is because with a very few handful of VMs, they can like saturate the IO the IOPS of the cluster if you have a spinning disk cluster. So we want to sort we 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 like need to throttle those clients so that they don't overwhelm them. Then we can have thousands. We have like seven thousand clients now. Um, but if we then threw a CephFS on there, on that same cluster, we can't throttle. CephFS doesn't have the same knobs to throttle the, the, the IOs. So you could have few like very active CephFS users then taking all the IOPS of the cluster and then disturbing the, you know, the database guys that just want to run their, run their databases. Um, so in the end, it's because of those like inability to, to like have Q QoS guarantees between the different pools. That's what makes us separate right now. Also for operations reasons, like there are, there are pragmatic re reasons related to when you're updating things that, that often like put you in the direction of separating things. Um, maybe you, maybe like block storage is actually very simple. It's, it's, um, it's very rock solid very few bugs. I don't remember any bugs like in years. Um, so you can upgrade that. You can follow the latest upstream with, with block storage clusters or pure Rados clusters. But um, S3 is like a little bit more complex. You might want to like wait a little bit and see and test things more carefully. And CephFS as well, like this, it's, has, it's so complex, a, a POSIX file system that you really want to test. The users can do anything. So you would want to test this before rolling out. So that, that's another operational reason to keep it separated. Um, yeah, but you can, the thing is that you can easily like, in the end, it's not a big problem for us because you can so readily just drain nodes, move data around. There's never actually a problem where, oh, I've got too many like free bytes in this cluster, and not enough this other one. You can always just like drain nodes and then add them to the other cluster, move hardware around anyway. So we operate 14 or so or 15 clusters now, and it's, it's it's pretty it's pretty okay pretty easy. Thanks. Okay, um, we've got Alberto and Kirill. We have got to the top of the hour, but if you guys are okay, Dan and Pablo, with just a few more minutes. No problem yeah. for me. Okay. Yeah, okay. No problem. Okay. Uh, so Alberto and then Kirill, and then we'll try and wrap up. Okay, so I have two two quick questions. Hopefully, uh, one is uh, the what's the size of the team that that's managing the uh, uh, Ceph? I, I was there a couple of years ago, and I don't know what's the how did the situation evolve? Yeah, all the Ceph is um, there's two staff, so me and another staff member, and and uh, and we have two fellows. So that's like a like a junior a junior person. Um, Soon we'll have only one fellow, unfortunately. Pablo, how many on the HPC team? So the HPC team is, uh, well, it's me and Niels, uh, one other staff member who is, uh, who doesn't do the, the HPC full time. So it's mostly, it's mostly me. <laughs> um, but the batch team is, is larger. It's maybe 12 people uh, who manage different aspects of all the computing, computing infrastructure. So, um, the HD Conger clusters is maybe more like five people, and uh, and there's we have volunteer computing, and we have other services related to accounting and, and such. But HPC, it's 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 uh, like one and a half people. Okay, yeah. we're yeah, cheating, of course, because we have like procurement teams and like operations teams yeah. that 
Well, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we also don't mention the OpenStack team. Like the OpenStack team help, helps us with all of the high level stuff. Like we basically don't deal with users because the users are all OpenStack users and they, they funnel the, they do the support tickets and things like that. And they also get all the nice APIs for, for carving up mm -hmm. these staff spaces and make them consumable. Yeah, Still imp uh, impressively few people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, really. Yeah, I mean, just um, to expand on Dan's comment, we're, we're layered as in, you know, just just, just like the, the infrastructure layers. So you have the, the OpenStack guys and then you have different components built on top. So if you're, if you're somebody like, uh, if you're running, for instance, like me, the HPC service, you do get users, you can do user tickets and you do support uh, the users uh, directly, such as, you know, the, the physicists, the theorists, the engineers. Um, if you're in the middle, your users will be other IT, IT services, right? Um, but we, we do benefit, like the HPC service benefits from all the layers below, the monitoring team, the config, config team, the OpenStack team, et cetera. Silly and impressive, I would say. <laughs> uh, my second question is probably for Pablo. Uh, it's about uh, Lazy.io. Uh, I, I was playing with it when I, when I was doing my master's degree on, on this. Um, I remember that it was quite quite difficult to uh, uh, to use Lazy.io outside of the Ceph uh, Fuse mount. Uh, I don't know if, if you if you were able to uh, uh, I don't know to, to to come up with an easier library to to enable uh, Lazy.io on a single file or a single directory or something like that. Yes. So in fact, yeah, I was just going to ask you, Dan. Thanks for moving. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, so back then it was the we were mostly using set fuse mounts, but with the kernel mount things are a lot better, a lot easier. And in fact, there's also a, you can use libf libcephfs, which is a user space library, and actually it works great. And um, somebody from Red Hat, Mark from Red Hat, and me, we we contributed code to IOR. Actually, oh. I didn't I didn't actually mention this uh, when I yeah. was giving out the slides, but uh, IOR the the HPC benchmark there's a, mo a CFFS mode in it, and it supports lazy IO. Only the basic mode for lazy IO, as in just just like non-overlapping writes. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that, that was was I, I was working on at the time, and then I didn't have enough time to to put everything together. But that's great. Thank you. We should, we should add though that this is not like it's not heavily used because CFFS doesn't have a huge amount of traction at HPC uh, field yet. Um, Lazy IO is still one of those like, yes, it's implemented and yes, it works mostly, but it doesn't like get the same test coverage of the rest of Ceph and most users don't ever enable it. So we're all like, as users, we're always kind of sharing this with other users, trying to get others interested so that we can, you know, have a critical mass that then this becomes a, a, like fully, 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 fully tested and supported like, mm -hmm. a, like the rest of Ceph. Thank you. Okay, maybe we can squeeze in a quick final question from Kirill and then we really will let you go. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you, uh, Pablo, for the great talk. But yeah, so just hopefully a quick question. Um, so do you guys not use Wester at all at CERN? Yeah, no, we don't. I know it's unconventional, okay. but no. How, how come you don't have any Wester? Well, that, that's, that, that was my, my first slides. Um, yeah. We, we already had quite a number of file systems and it could be, it could have also maybe been a choice and say, let's, let's just uh, run Luster. But the storage team was already running like a set of file systems and we didn't feel like supporting yet another file system, adding another file system to the zoo um, yeah. of file systems. Um, there were, uh, there were of course, tests, that? Yeah. yeah, there were of course tests like, um, I mean, because we've had open AFS for so long and like open AFS, like there have been several efforts to get rid of OpenAFS at CERN. Um, and uh, one of those was actually like evaluating Luster and doing some tests to see if we replace it with uh, replace our, all of our 3 billion files in OpenAFS with like the whole uh, worldwide like LHC computing grid accessing um, with Luster. And I guess, I don't know, this was before my time, but it was decided to stick with AFS. And then I suppose the other chance would have been when like, Ceph has, uh, sorry, CERN has always been writing its own file systems. We had something called Castor before, CERN like advanced storage, I think it was. Um, 
And then uh, at the time that the LHC started, Castor was not performant enough, so we needed something else. So then we used Xroot D, which is a storage framework written at Stanford or at Slack. Um, and we used Xroot D to build to build a simple like physics data store called EOS. Okay, so that's how that happened. That was like probably another chance where Luster was was tried. I think that we tried GPFS at that moment as well, um, but it was just simpler to to build something with with Xroot at that time. I don't know if that's like really why, because I think those decisions were probably taken like before both of us were were around in the storage groups. I mean, to be fair, when I joined, that was also my reaction. Like, we're not running Lasser or GPFS or, or but but actually, it, it works. It worked out. Um, that was our experience. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Okay, I think we're. We're, we're done and well <laughs> over time. So uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Pablo, for, for joining us and, and uh, talking to us about uh, Ceph, your experience with Ceph. And hope to see you around soon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to chat anymore. If you thank make you it to Portland, yeah. either see you there or maybe you can pop down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs>